On April 23, 2017, the Amenia Historical Society invited hometown boy George Phillips, 91 years old at the time, to share his memories of his World War II experience, which include the Battle of the Bulge. George was born in Yonkers in 1925, but his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Royal C. Phillips, moved to Amenia with their three children when George was only six months old. They purchased a depot store, which was just across the street from the Amenia train station. The family lived on the second floor. They had chickens in the backyard. The store sold fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh milk from a local dairy, as well as meat and canned goods. They also sold things like linoleum, seed potatoes, and gasoline from a pump out front. George and his brothers walked to the Amenia School, passing the Amenia Theater on the way, unless they took a shortcut across the ball field. After school each day, the boys worked in the family store, stocking shelves, sorting vegetables, and when old enough to drive, delivering groceries to homes and farms in the area. George attended all 12 grades, graduating from Amenia High in 1943. Just two months later, on August 5, 1943, George enlisted in the U.S. Army Reserve's Specialized Technical Program. He attended Auburn College with the promise that the Army would pay for his college education. But only three months later, in November of 1943, George and the other young men in the program were sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, for induction into the regular army. After 17 weeks of basic training, he was an 18-year-old soldier boy in the 3rd Army, 87th Division, 347th Infantry, 3rd Battalion, Company G, 3rd Platoon. I was Staff Sergeant. Yep. George was a rifleman in the infantry. I, just hear you were a I was a platoon sergeant, but they couldn't give me the rank because the roster, company roster was already full. So they gave it to me at discharge. So is this your brother? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is coming home after a few years. You compared the two. I don't know what that is. I still have my cartridge built on. <laughs> You've been through it. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, I, some of this I've kind of put in order because I felt that that kind of tells, tells a story too. And this was a, a picture that we have at the Media Historical mm -hmm. Society showing a parade in Media, everything about 1930. <clears throat> and you've got this deep car over here at the Tidal Station. And then you've got the fountain there. And you got the state policemen out here directing traffic. You sure it's not George Dunbar? That's George Dunbar. George Dunbar, George Dunbar. Dunbar. okay. Yeah. Our town constable. Okay, <laughs> town constable. Sniff and spook, they call them. Uh, that's a parade in the media. Yeah. And the banks paid 4% savings back in those days. Wow. And this is another kind of parade? Yeah. And this is George's... Hike, hike through the mud. That was a long line. It's a long line. Mm -hmm. yeah. George wanted me to put this in. Because it did kind of show, what, what's the comment you had about this? Playing in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get that Jeep out. There's two enemies in, the, in that battle. Um, the Germans and the winter. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, George, you want, do you need to point her to point out? Let's see, where did you start? Well, no, you can just follow the line around. This, this one here? Mm -hmm. This is Bastogne. Mm -hmm. This is the, where the 101st Division was uh, surrounded by Germans. And the commanding officer, when he was asked to surrender by the German commanding officer, said nuts. So, yeah, and then, then the uh, patent came roaring in there and saved him. 
right up with the bulge. Yeah, that's yeah. He was a good journal. He would drive up to the front. You could see him. His Jeep had the three three stars on it on the bumper and a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on in a Jeep. Sirens and big horns. He lived it up. And then he would fly back in a pipe his Piper Club to go back to the where he's staying. But many times saw him. So he was and George commented and as we know Patton was the fighting man's general and he was out on the front. Or on the front or straight in the back. Mm -hmm. So this is this is uh, this whole area is George's military history pretty much. I was on the first tank into the city of Plauen and the war was over. That was it. So this is Metz, you were stationed in Metz, you left from Metz to... Uh... Yeah. We went from Metz to the Bulge. So this, as a farmer, this is, uh, looks like wreckage, okay? But when I studied it, yeah. you can see it's a reaper binder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, we landed at Le Havre, and uh, the U.S. Navy and the British Navy shelled the, just destroyed the whole city. It was just flattened rubble, the whole thing. And it took a couple months to rout them out because it was Really, they had good cover in the rubble. Yeah, the Germans. So, well, see, yep. the Normandy was down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And as they uh, as they advance, you know, they, after the Battle of Bulls, you were able to. Oh, somebody had. Somebody had a fly the pictures. So this is this is what George came home with. Wow. Those are all the medals they gave me, my dog tag. And the one on the end here was from New York State for service. And that's a ten franc note that was invasion money. Two dollars and fifty cents. That's all. And this was what you wore after the war. It's called the yep. ruptured duck. <laughs> ruptured duck is right. My father always called it the ruptured duck. Mm -hmm. And this was the division, the golden acorn division. Yep. And be careful about George. That's a rifle <laughs> metal. That's where Patton is buried, I believe, and uh, Sergeant Schultz, he was killed in pre ram Prairie. He's buried right close to where Patton is. So. That's a, uh, he was in the street and a mortar round dropped right near him, instantly killed, and his, he had a Browning automatic rifle, and that was all bent out of shape. So you know he never knew what hit him. That's all. And while we were in, we were to attack pre rom Prey. It's a little crossroads town in Belgium, and the first, it was a crossroads in, and the, there was a a built-up road going to it, and uh, the first platoon went to the right, and the third platoon went to the left, and we crossed a, a, a brook, water up to our knees. That was lovely. So 
We got into town, and the first house I came to, I dropped a grenade in it. And we heard hollering and screaming and crying. Out come two civilians. And here we are without a, any uh, anybody in command. So, and here we are uh, uh, bunched up in a house with no guard outside. Green troops, that's what we were. Lucky to get out of it. So anyway, myself and Palmer Montgomery, we went across the road to see the uh, where the first platoon was. Didn't see him, so he went back first and didn't know there was a tank up there and. When I got, when I started to cross, he fired an 88 round at me, and then the turbulence of that air blew me back 15, 20 feet down a little grade, and then he opened up with a machine gun, and he got my K rations. And I called him a dirty son of a bitch and bastard, I'll tell you. That's how I felt. So anyway, so we got in back to town and we waited and I guess about four or five o'clock they called us back. But the, the tank must have went back to get out of the way. Because there was um, an new officer with a, a bazooka man and they did get a shot off but the tank fired around at them and they were both killed so, so so that's the story and in the town of all Germany myself and a oh back up. So then Captain Mahanus, our company commander, he was a tall, lanky Virginian. He was a good, good leader, really. He was all, all over. He wasn't way back. And he said to me, Phillips, how would you like me, Sergeant? No, sir, thank you. Phillips, you will be. <laughs> That's how I got promoted. So, yeah, and uh, well, we're in this town of uh, Germany, and we're, myself and another uh, is Sergeant Maycumber. He was from the Air Corps because they were running out of troops, you know. So. Any non-essential person was up to the front. That was kind of tough for them. So we heard this shell coming in, and you can tell whether close or not. So I dived out the front, out of the door, and I used landed on my rifle butt to break the fall, and. He was right behind me, and he got killed, and I got a band-aid job. So that's how close things are. I'm lucky to be here, many times. So that's the fun part. So, so um, I can still remember where I was in Germany when I told us. President Roosevelt had died. Still there. Yep. So a lot of things you remember, but a lot of things you didn't. And we couldn't keep a diary, you know. So to give, if you were captured, you would have information for the enemy. So that's how that worked out. 
So when they were marching to surrender, there was prisoners walking on both sides of the highway. The Autobahn was just like Taconic Parkway, the same thing. And uh, to, you know, to get away from the Russians because the prisoners, German prisoners that went to Russia, they were worked to death and starved to death. So, and there was only about 25,000 that ever made it back. So how they did that, I don't know. At Metz, we relieved the 26th Division at Obergail Bach. I guess that was part of France. A lot of casualties. And it was pretty round pretty after that. Yeah, that I did. That I talked about. Oh, the medic asked me if I wanted a Purple Heart. I did. I refused. I didn't. I didn't want my parents to know that that I was in 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 combat. I wished I'd had. <laughs> I'll tell you. And in the states. They asked me if I wanted to go to Cooks and Baker School. Um, the mess sergeant, Sergeant Kovacic, he kicked my butt for something I did wrong. I don't know what the hell it was. And so I never did. If I had, I would have been a mile in the rear, sleeping at a building or tents. Here we are in a foxhole, two men, one man two hours awake, the other sleeping, and because if you didn't, you could get a German bayonet. That's what you had to do. And it was, um, you just had to do it, that's all. And sleep was kind of, kind of uh, short in supply, you know. Um, yeah. But the 300 airplanes for the kamikaze to get us invading Japan, and if anybody says we shouldn't have used the atom bomb, I'll tell them go to hell in a handbasket, because that would have been a slaughter. The civilians even had bamboo spears, so that's how fanatic those people were. Yep. So you came home and you opened up the edge wood. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here is the description you had charcoal broilers, <coughs> deep freeze units, automatic ice makers, yep. whatever do food, all kinds of modern equipment. Well, and this is where <clears throat> My life with uh, George kind of intersected. <laughs> but he had the Edgewood there, which was uh, on the border of New York and Connecticut. And it was the place to go. It was the place to go. And if you had a date, it was the place to go for a nice meal. And uh, wish we had it still. I wish we had it still. Uh, really. And there was the dining room which was very, always kept very well. The dining room. And George was always uh, there to greet you there. And when you were on a Friday or Saturday night, when you were going out with uh, some of the guys, this was a place you could come and sit and talk. So, well, Nice, nice 
nice group of decent people. Yeah, definitely. Always was a good place to go. You could be sure that it wouldn't be loud or raucous or anything like that. This is a good place to go. Gentle. Huh? Gentle. Yeah, gentle. Mm -hmm. Oops. There he is. There's, there's the cake. Did you do that, George? Did you make the cake? No. No way. <laughs> no way. That's Royal Brothers Webster. Around Christmas time, and there's George again. Now, <clears throat> one of the hazards about going to George's house today is that you can't get out of there without a loaf of bread. <laughs> that, uh, I made 16 big loaves to a clip. Every Mixed it all with hand by hands. Today I use food handler's gloves. Don't stick. Beautiful. <laughs> really. Just take them off and chuck them. <laughs> and I make five loaves to a time. That's all I can get in the oven. But they're smaller loaves, you know. They're pretty good size, George. I mean. but now, this is after that. George is always afraid about throwing money out of the window. So uh, he found a new, a new kind of thing, thing to do as a contractor, putting in uh, windows. The renov your authorized rentals renovator. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know it's relatively new, not that long ago because you still have the 373 number. <clears throat> Not a cell phone number, not an email address. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's it, George. Is that it? You got, have you got anything more to say? Any questions? Those windows were so tight, you couldn't hear the car traffic or the dogs barking. They saved a lot of money. And I was on the Freedom Flight to Washington, D.C. Boy, that was beautiful, I'll tell you. Motorcycle escort both ways. Firemen would have their uh, engines were making a, a, an arc over our heads going through. And we had a personal escort to go with us. And it was funded by ShopRite, so that's a pretty good store. I don't know how long you're going to do it, but they did it. We had lunch and dinner. It was the Veterans World War II Memorial. It took them 50 years to build it, or better. And the unknown Veterans World War I Memorial and they had the changing of the guard. Those guys were, they couldn't drink or smoke while they were on, on duty or, or during the time that they were there. That's what it was. And we saw the monument of the Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima. That was nice. It was a good trip, and on the way home, it was the same thing all backwards, same thing all over again. And the families, those kids, families of kids, it must have been five, 500 camp families with small kids. It was amazing. That was a nice thought. So. So, thank you very much, George. Has anybody got a...